Hey, what's up everybody? Um, this is Rob here. Just doing a voice check just to make sure um we're coming through loud and clear. Um you can send a message if you if you're hearing loud and clear, let me know. So hey everyone, I'm Robert Yates, just trying to introduce myself again to everybody. I'm the owner of Equilibrium Media and your host for this brand new online podcast series. Um, we're streaming live on Facebook and YouTube at the same time. So um, first time doing this, just let us know if you're having any issues um, in the stream. Just comment in the chat if you're facing any issues. Really excited to do this live chat with our guest today. First, let me know um, what you guys think. Um, I just want to say how much I appreciate you guys tuning in for those of you who are here. Um, and I hope we can keep you entertained and informed during this time. Uh, make sure to share this live on all your platforms. Subscribe. Hit the button on the top of your page. Um, feel free to ask questions and we'll, we'll get to them in the chat when we can. However, this conversation today is with a friend I met through some collaborative work at Healing with Horses in Buku Tobago. Big shout out to Veronica for the connection. So it's Autism Awareness Month. Even though we're dealing with a lot of this COVID-19 all the time in the news, um, you know, other things are happening in the world as well. So it's Autism Awareness Month and we're trying to share a little bit of information about the cause. So... Today, we're here with Vanda Lee Richardson, an autism consultant and equine animal-assisted interaction and learning professional. So, um, Wanda, could you tell me a bit of what you do and like how, how it affects us now, especially this time? Okay, well, hi, everybody, anyone who's listening. Um, so yeah, I am an autism consultant. So I work with nonprofit organizations. I work with families. I work with teachers and basically just giving information about understanding autism and how we can continue to support and accommodate the needs of the autism community so that we can include autistic persons into society, into the you know, job sphere, just into our community. Okay, and why, why do you think like this inclusiveness is really important, especially right now um, where a lot of people might be isolated and, you know, um, people might be at home with their kids? Um, what is the importance of community and strengthening that community, as you say? Yeah, um, you know, for autism families and for the community themselves, they're so isolated, you know. 
Um, even the services that they receive, it's in isolation to the rest of us. So it's really important for them to have a support network and to be included. And even in times like COVID, it's even more important to use, you know, social media um, and these type of platforms to really kind of bridge that gap so that they still have, they don't feel left out and they don't feel excluded. Um, and I've, of course, during this time, I've gotten so much contacts about, you know, parents now needing the support more than ever because they're home with their kids. Um, and now more than ever, they're feeling even more isolated and losing that ability to take their kids outdoors, which usually would bring relief to their day and to their child. Um, so it's, it's been a very busy time. So it's really good to have this social media platform to right. discuss autism. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think it's really important that we, um, we use the tools at our disposal right now um, so that we could yeah, connect with each other. I mean, we're social beings. Um, all humans are social beings, and we need that sense of connection and community. So I would imagine, you know, you would know a lot about that from... You were telling me a bit of your past when we had a little conversation earlier, but, like, you had 900, over 900 um, friends or clients or, you know, people that you've worked with over, over your years. So um, could you tell me a little bit, or could you tell, you know, the viewers a little bit more about your journey and... Um, teaching and raising awareness yeah um so yeah it, it's it's been awesome i really like to think of it as my like adventures through autism because that's really what it's been it's been one incredible play-based journey that i've been on um something that i think is important to understand about autism is there's so much diversity in it um and i think you know typically we we've viewed autism through a behavioral lens so we're just looking for certain behaviors and then putting a label and judging those behaviors um, but in my experience i've found that there's so much diversity and it's beyond behavior it's just a way of being a way of processing the environment um, a different way of processing sensory information social information um, you know that's the heart of autism and um I've really enjoyed my journey because I think uh, I could relate a lot to some of my autistic friends. I prefer to say friends and clients. Um, and, you know, I grew up with a lot of anxiety. I grew up having a lot of difficulty regulating myself. Um, and a lot of females on the spectrum, they go through this as well, where sometimes, you know, um, they can develop an eating disorder or they can, you know, find themselves responding very aggressively to certain emotions and um, so my you know my journey has been a lot of learning empathy learning how to understand autism and how to support their needs and um, you know helping them through their challenges but they are incredible and every autistic person I've ever met they have so much value to offer but unfortunately they're so isolated and we're not accommodating them enough in our community. Understood, understood. Right, so I mean, um, basically, how do, you, how do you think people with a, with a normal, I, I don't wanna make others because that's, I feel like that's part of the problem in that we other a lot of people, or we have certain boxes for people. Um, but what could you, what could you say that what makes them different in terms of the brain? I've, I watched an infographic video a while ago um, yeah. on how the brain is wired and, you know, social connections and these kind of things. But how, how would you kind of break that down for the everyday man, you know, just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is, yeah that's a really good and it's probably the most common question <laughs> that I get is like, how would I identify autism? Mm. Um, and... Across the board, despite the diversity in autism, the social challenges are constant. You know, that is something that I would say really defines autism and it's across the board. Um, and the way I think of it is, you know, me and you, we would be considered neurotypical, you know. Okay. Um, we're, we're sort of... It's a fancy word, mind. but we're typical. <laughs> we're basically, basically basic, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, think that, I love that. We are basic. So basic <laughs> Um, and for all of us basic persons, right, right. Um, we're kind of born with this wiring to absorb social information. <laughs> so 
that's a mom with a baby. We're producing oxytocin. We are socially taking in information, eye contact, facial features. And through our social experiences, we then start to um, kind of then download more and more information when we interact. And for a person with autism, they are, you know, it's almost as if in the brain, there are a couple of wires that are just not the same as me and you. And what that means is that they sometimes, because of their autism, they're blocking out certain experiences and situations. So, but it's not like a, it's not like a choice that is made. It's just literally like hardwired. Yeah, it, they're not actively making that choice. You know, there's so many things in the environment that sometimes is stressful to them. And as a result, they're just blocking out uh, information that me and you kind of seek out, you know, which is social information. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you do get into a relationship with them and they're now starting to absorb this social information, unfortunately, it's almost as if they have to manually input the information, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's really hard for them to also interpret, like, why am I downloading this information? Like, why is this important? It's like, because, um, I mean, it might be recognized as a survival feature um, in their hardwiring, but, you know, in the neurotypical sense, we understand that is like, it's a survival, you know, because we have to interact with others, but for them, it might be different, yeah. you know, they might be focused on something else in a way. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and that's why, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, we need social interactions to survive and just to get through our daily existence, you know. Mm. So it is something that we have to work on um, with, you know, the community is, you know, helping them develop these social skills. They also want relationships. You know, I've never met someone on the spectrum who didn't want a relationship or didn't want a friendship. Um, it's just they require so much more support. And me and you, we just take for granted that we can just carry on a small talk and a conversation anytime, any place, you know. True. Um, but for them, they can get very lost in like, uh, like sarcasm sometimes. Right, because it's like almost you know? figuring out a new technology, I would Im imagine, you know, like conversation and, you know, just analyzing someone's face and this kind of like understanding laughter and this kind of thing. It's like a technology if you think about it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that could be hard, that could be, that could be tough. Yeah, and you know, that one I definitely will say is across the board, you know, like there's some kids who are actually all teens, adults who are hyperverbal, you know, right. but you kind of have to explain to them that, you know, it's a give and take, you know. That's right, like, so they've understood it, they've understood it like to the extreme now, so they've like, you know, yeah. learned this technology, all right, okay. Yeah, and then it comes off as a script sometimes, so then you have to, you know, help them be authentic, but mm. still be able to interpret social information and what could be an appropriate response or how our behavior might affect that other person, you know? Understood. Um, yeah, that's kind of the core of it. And then, of course, there's so much diversity. You know, they process sensory information differently, how they uh, select the foods that they eat. They're very sensitive, I would say. Um, okay. But they just have this very interesting way of processing the world. Like, they blow my mind. And I like that you use that word basic because mm -hmm. in their presence, I sometimes feel so basic. <laughs> like, why couldn't I see the tree that way? Why couldn't uh, I see, you know? So they have really opened my eyes to seeing the world in such a unique and different way. Okay. Um, and I think that's one of the valuable things that we don't talk enough about with autism, you know? And I mean, I would, I would imagine that has something to do with your, your social media name and your, like your whole um, mission, which is empathy. Um, and I, I'd like you to touch on that a little bit. Like what, why, why would empathy or why, you know, an empathetic yeah. nature? Yeah, I mean, you know, of <clears> course, <throat> I was thinking for a while about, you know, starting this sort of consulting um, business. And of course, you're stuck on a name, like, what's my name going to be? Um, and I came up with Empathway because I think through all my life experiences, as hard as every lesson was to learn, it made me more empathetic. And the more that I developed this skill of empathy is the more effective I was in working with um, an autistic person. And, you know, my idea is that sometimes I feel like we're on like a kind of a concrete road and it doesn't always work for everybody, mm -hmm. you know. Hard, hard in a way. Yeah, and we're kind of scared. Like, nobody wants to bear off the road, you know? Like, it's paved already, 
uh, and even though we're struggling, we're so scared to like step off of it, you know. Um, and for me, I took a jump a couple of years ago and just stepped off that road. And I decided I really wanted to create a pathway. I wanted other people to see that there are some footprints leading off this concrete road. And, you know, maybe if we all travel along this journey, we can become more empathetic. And the more empathetic we are, the more we're not judgmental, the more we can include people for their differences, you know, and not be so separated all the time. So, um, you know, that's kind of how I came about with the name and pathway because it's the foundation for how I interact with people and how I live my lifestyle and how I hope that a lot more people want to try being more empathetic because it changes your world, you know? Okay, sorry sorry to interrupt there. We're just having a little bit of um, technical issues. Um, right now we have some Windows notifications coming up on the screen. So I think I'm going to try to just like clear those or mute those for now um if anybody's sharing or commenting sorry um it might it might be coming up on the screen but uh we're, we're just taking it a step at a time so is everything okay on the screen otherwise or just check in with people maybe we could be a little empathetic about the um <laughs> the live stream is first <laughs> first time we're getting into this right now so um Is the voice okay now? Is my voice okay now? All right, cool. Um, so yeah, somebody somebody said we um we're seeing the script on the screen right now. I'm not sure if that's for everybody. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so basically, I mean, you, you, you're talking about empathy and I mean, how it changes your life and why I kind of want to touch why, why it's changed your life. So specifically, I, I know, you know, it might be a personal topic for you to touch on. Um, but, um, why do you think empathy is important for everybody? Because I mean, um. everybody, everybody's going through some form of grief in some way, some, some, some form of um trauma in some way and i feel like empathy and compassion is kind of like the um cure for that in a way or like you know the balance of that yeah you know it, it totally is and um you know especially in my work with working with parents you know that's i think for me the most emotional aspect of what i do um and i'm kind of grateful in a way for some of the situations that has happened because it made me more empathetic to understanding how I could support parents, especially because, I mean, it's their child and this is their, um, you know, lifelong um, concern, you know, what's going to happen to my kid, how things are going to develop. And they're the ones who are the primary caregivers, you know, um, in my own personal experience, uh, you know, my mom was diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis and um, that was actually a very defining feature for me being able to connect more with the parents I was working with um, because it, it made me develop empathy. You know, I uh, had all these qualifications and this background. And when I look back on it, um, the way I handled my mom's diagnosis, it was really messy and it was really um, mm. raw and um, it was not as graceful <laughs> as I would have thought that I would have handled it because I'm in this profession. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. you know um and i experienced such a whirlwind of emotions you know the resentment the disappointment the um and i now understand so much and have so much empathy for how a parent feels going through the diagnostic process because despite the fact that i had all the information in the back of my brain when you're going through these intense traumas and emotional experiences it's so hard to access your own skills and talents, you know. It's hard to um, apply that knowledge practically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you know, then I, then I think this is something a lot of parents also relate to with me, is that then you start to, over time, feel kind of like this shame at how you reacted and how you responded. And, you know, it's this whole process until you learn 
you know, your coping mechanisms, your strategies, and um, it really helped me to build a, a way of supporting parents, you know, having gone through an experience myself, and uh, it, it kind of bursted my empathy, you know, going through that experience, and also knowing what it's like to care for another person, you know? Okay, understood, understood. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you, you, you spoke about your mom. That's something that could affect you personally as well. Um, and as you said, a lot of parents are dealing with some of these traumas right now. And mm -hmm. they might necessarily have those tools and attributes, but how can you help them? How can you, what are some of the techniques that you use in your field to, to, to deal with things? I mean, like in terms of coping, in terms of um, play therapy, in terms of, um, you know, basically just understanding what's happening as well, you know, emotionally. Mm -hmm. How would you how would you yeah. advise people right now, especially like people at home, maybe with kids, uh, maybe teachers, because teachers may be going through some form of anxiety right now. Um, mm -hmm. I would imagine. So let me know how how they could deal with that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, just going back to how much you know, there's so much sensitivity in autism. So the most important thing for me is you always have to be present and you always have to be regulated you know you yourself have to be in a position where you can respond instead of reacting you know because reacting is what we do when we're emotional and we're stressed um so you have to make sure that before you address a challenge that you are regulated yourself because otherwise you can get into a cycle of just negative reactions and you know as a parent you can experience trauma from your interactions with your autistic child. Um, so one of the things that I like to tell, you know, parents is they need to find their own way to manage their stress. Because even for me, every year, how I manage and cope with my own stress, it looks different, you know, and it doesn't have to be like intense things like you know doing yoga every day because most mm -hmm. autism parents do not have time to do yoga every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm also a yoga instructor and there are days when I'm so, you know, overwhelmed that I don't want to sit on my mat and meditate. I'd rather kick a bag or do some boxing, you know. Mm. So <laughs> you have to find for yourself, like there's no do step one, step two, step three. Like you have to learn yourself and know right now I need a to go for a run. Right now I need to have a nice cup of coffee. Right now I'm going to go in the shower, put on some hot water and do a few stretches for my body. It's like tiny doses of self-care throughout the day that's really important for a parent. And especially getting through COVID, you know, you have to find these little moments, even if it is listening to a song that you like, you know, uh, while you're washing the dishes, doing something that brings you out of your stress because otherwise you can just get into these cycles of negative reactions, you know? Um, and I think the second... Yeah, the second little thing that I think works for me, this is my kind of coping mechanism, um, <clears throat> is I kind of call it the be present, but also peek through the window, you know? Um, so like with my mom, you know, if you're always looking through that window of the future, you can really sink into despair, you know? Like you start to worry, you start to panic, you're thinking about finances and uh, who's going to care for this person and, and how are things going to evolve? And that could really... You kind of Brilliant. build in, you build in this map in your head of how things might be, but you know, you kind of feed in that in a way. Yeah, and you know, I have a big imagination, which is great, but when, <laughs> you're, when you're scared or when you're anxious, your imagination is your enemy, you know, because you can just really create these scenarios that are just, you know, depressing, you yeah. know. So, I've been seeing a lot of memes about like overthinking. There's so many memes about overthinking, so it's obviously a thing, you know, like a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. And, and the more that you're anxious and creative is the more that you can really get into that space of overthinking. Mm -hmm. So I had to, you know, change that and just say, okay, I'm always going to be present. I'm always going to focus on what are my current challenges? How can I support these challenges? And then every so often, I kind of just do a peek through the window. And for me, that's whether it is that I start thinking about what changes I need to make in the house, railings, what support she might need in the future. 
but I don't spend too much time looking through that window because it could really set you back. Okay. So for parents, it's, you know, you have to be present when you're with your kids, deal with the challenges that you have now and really unburden your heavy emotions. You know, you have to release those things. So for me with parents, sometimes I just listen to them. I don't judge them. And I also share with them my story because there is some shame in how we react to a diagnosis at first. And sometimes by sharing that story with them, it takes me off of any kind of pedestal. So they're not like looking at me like I think I'm better or I'm some sort of professional. Mm. Uh, they're just able to relate and offload some of the, you know, emotions and thoughts. And that has actually been one of the best mechanisms of supporting families is just listening and being empathetic. Okay. I I, um, I have your page open here, actually, Empathway. Um, I don't know if everybody's seeing here. You could go check out her page, empathway.asd on Instagram. And I mean, I've been paying attention to your stories uh, every now and then, you know, just tuning in. And some of, the, some of the main things that hit me, you know, like today we're going to this, check this out. Today we're going to discuss engaging boys indoors during COVID-19. Um, so yeah, you shared some, some things people can do with their kids, um, really basic things in a way. And I kind of related to some of them. I was like flashing back to childhood, you know what I mean? Like yeah, <laughs> making trains and this kind of stuff. But the importance of that, when you grow up, you kind of, um, you replace those things with other more, co maybe complex things. And you feel like maybe the complex things are better. But, you, yeah. you know, the basics really hold true now. So could you describe, like, why these basic activities <laughs> are awesome now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think sometimes we overthink these things. And, you know, now you have, like, play therapists and recreational therapists, um, you know, and all these different types of therapies that adults are administering. And... The sad fact about coming an, an adult is that we become so serious and we feel that in order to prove ourselves as a professional, we need to be more serious, you know? Um, and for me, I found that just didn't work with kids on the spectrum. Like they need your silliness, they need like, and they need it genuinely. Like they don't want your basic half-hearted attempt to be silly. They really want you to go all in and be fun and be exciting and take them on an adventure, you know? Mm. Um, so, you know, part of that is as a parent or as a teacher if, or you're a therapist, you know, reconnecting with what it's like to be a child, like imagining what life was before you knew what a tree was, you know, and you're just exploring the world with this, you know, blank lens, you know? A fresh, um, a fresh kind of idea. Yeah, like I don't have all the answers and I also don't have to teach kids facts. Right. I want them to think for themselves. I want Vibes. them to, yeah, tell me what's your theory? You know, what is this animal? I know it's a worm, but it could be anything. You know, mm. like a long time ago, people just discovered things and gave them names. And sometimes as teachers, we take away a kid's ability to discover, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it's just a process of rediscovering the box the box is the most basic and fun thing you can give to a kid you know mm. because a box can turn into anything you know and it it, it speaks to imagination and playfulness and uh, it's also how I regulate myself I always think how much have I laughed today how much has my the kid laughed or the family like how have we played have we enjoyed what we did does your um, measurement stick like like positive um emotional yeah. feedback yeah that's good for real yeah yeah for me it's not about like oh what does the parents think i checked off the you know mm. objectives list today you know <laughs> my, my you know my goal is relationship establishing trust safety and having fun you know because that really engages somebody on the spectrum you know um it's kind of shocking for them when they're like oh my god this is an adult but they're kind of cool they're kind of awesome <laughs> you know <laughs> um so yeah, I love posting those activities for, you know, think less and just follow the child, you know, whatever they're interested in, um, make it fun, make it engaging and eventually get the hang of it. And it's just the easiest thing in the world is to play, you know. Okay, I got you. 
Yeah, I mean, play therapy, that's kind of like touching on the basis of play therapy. Um, that's one of the points we had to cover today. Um, and I mean, I guess there's so many different ways of doing play therapy, but um, yeah, as you grow up, you kind of lose a sense of playing in a way. Well, I, I personally would have felt that um, on my journey. And it's like, sometimes you have to probably realign yourself and find out what you enjoy, you know what I mean? Theater games, I'm seeing any comments right now. What do you think about theater games? <laughs> oh, I love it. Please go on my page. I'm sure you'll see I dress up all the time. It's the best way to teach social skills and engagement. Um, mm. And I think it's lame that we have to dress up just on Halloween, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> so I, I love it. You know, you step into a different role. It really gets everybody engaged and involved. I do this a lot with parents too. Like, I've painted, you know, unicorns on dad's faces. Like, <laughs> just everyone, like, let's just get down and silly. And that's how you get the most engagement out of people, you know? Like, it's not always about, like, yoga, meditation, and just, you know, sometimes it's just play. You know, so theater is awesome. Reenactment's awesome. I mean, yeah, that's how you would learn new things. And I mean, adaptability is probably the word we're looking for right now as well, because um, especially in this time right now, um, this whole this whole podcast thing is basically my way of adapting to these kind of new situations. Um, for the past two weeks, I've just been kind of like zoning in. And it's kind of my form of play then, you know, it's not physical yeah. but i probably need the physical as well huh? it's just it's yeah. more like technical play or whatever or visual play so yeah. i i highly recommend like anybody who needs to reconnect with their childlike sense just go and play in some dirt like <laughs> it is the most grounding thing it's actually what started uh, i've painted myself in mud with kids um i've done so many different things and it just reconnected me to this childlike happiness that like gets lost in adult land you know mm. in adulthood you know so play in the dirt play in the dirt mm -hmm. so yeah um i mean we could move on a little bit more now to um like demographics a lot of people may think well you know i'm not autistic or i'm not on the spectrum but how are you so sure if you haven't been tested similar to the covid19 <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean like so you were saying you were saying earlier like a lot of people in their 30s um, you were breaking down the demographics with between men and women and stuff uh, what are some of the demographics and breakdowns of people on the spectrum yeah um, it's really interesting because there are lots of times uh, I'm working with a family and we do like parent trainings and you know we do a lot of these play date sessions and at some point, like, the mom might come to me and be like, I think my husband's on the spectrum, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, like, and it, so there are a lot of adults who actually get these late diagnoses because, you know, they're probably very hyper-focused in a profession, in a field. They have the verbal language, and everyone probably ignored some of their social quirks. Mm. Um, and you find that sometimes the stress of, like, parenting or marriage, certain life events really makes it apparent that uh, they are autistic. So, and you see it a lot more in girls because we have actually viewed autism so much through the male lens, right? Um, so we're looking that for behaviors that we typically see in boys. But the truth is, autism is autism. And we have gender differences, like between me and you. So how autism will be expressed in a female and how it will be expressed in a male are very different and for a long time the literature did not you know really highlight the difference in how females autism is expressed so you would find very often a lot of women with autism get very late diagnoses you know sometimes as an adult um, in their 20s 30s even 40s they like know? fly under the radar you were saying that you know um, and I mean this is a known thing that girls are more emotionally um, adaptable and um you know, they're just, their brain functions much differently from guys in terms of um, emotional intelligence, is, is that the word? Yeah, yeah, and you know, absolutely. And even when you look at the differences between boys and girls, right, you see that girls usually have high language skills and verbal abilities compared to boys who have, um, they show very strong motor skills and, you know, motor abilities from a young age. 
um, so these um, autistic women, you know, they kind of fly under the radar and they can mask their autism because they have the verbal abilities. They kind of learn social scripts. So you can not really realize that they're actually really struggling to interpret social situations and to create the bonds that they want, the friendships that they want. Mm. Um, so it could really take a long time. And especially because women are emotional and emotionally intelligent. I think sometimes people just assume, oh, maybe that girl just has a bit of anxiety, is just a bit socially shy, you know, but truly it's autism and they often lose a lot of support. And it's, um, they have these moments of finally I understand after being diagnosed why I had all these challenges. Mm. And they do wish that they got that support younger, that they had somebody, you know, helping them and, and making it easier for them, you know? Yeah, that could be that could be free. And I mean, knowledge is power and that, that kind of sense of knowing why something is the way it is or why I might be the way I am. Um, yeah. That's that's freeing and powerful for sure. Um, sorry, I'm having a little brain fart there. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay i think like um like learning and forgetting like relearning and forgetting i feel like that's something we do as people um we might say we learn a concept early up in life and then we don't really address it again we don't really we put it in a box or as you say they learn scripts and then you know at the end of it their life becomes like a scripted kind of um movie in a way they have to like work towards this movie as opposed to just expressing themselves freely in a way i don't know yeah that is oh i love how you put that because you know that's exactly what i don't want you know i personally have never um taught social skills uh you know to autistic persons not in the conventional sense like you know i bought a book the other day just out of curiosity of what a book like uh teaching autism social skills you know what it looks like and I just couldn't relate to it because I thought, you know, we learn social skills through a relationship, through a friendship. So the best way for me to, you know, help someone with their challenges is to first have a relationship with them and then allow them to be confident and still be who they are. Because a lot of um, autistic persons, they're always being fixed. You know, every person comes into their life trying to fix them and change them and get them to resemble us. But that's not the point. The point is we need to be more empathetic and accommodating of them. And we need to allow them to be free to express themselves, you know, because they're beautiful, they're valuable, they're wonderful. You know, I, uh, I had no one in my family with autism. I just thought they were the most beautiful population to work with, you know. Um, and I just wish more people would accept and appreciate them. You know, don't try to teach them skills and a script, you know, just help them to be part of the community, but still be who they are. You know, that's the most important thing. It's funny, funny that you say that there's a, a little mini documentary I watched on a, on a lady who was autistic, um, who is autistic. And she, um, I think in high school and stuff, she was bullied basically um, mm -hmm. for the way she was. And um, later on in life, not right now, I don't know if you guys could look it up, but it's called the Charlie Project. She runs the Charlie Project and um, her niche or what what part of the community she got involved in um, not so much sounding like choice by choice but something that she's just fixated on um, mm -hmm. is finding or not finding missing people but documenting missing people um, around yeah and so she has like the largest database of missing people and she's an autistic person and literally just like home um, she she works with like the US archives and this kind of stuff and you know, it's really, it's really amazing to see that kind of special ability. And I think that's sometimes what people have in mind of um, people on the spectrum. They have some really amazing ability, but is, is the environment that you put these people in, in a way? Yeah, um, you know, that's the thing. If you can help an autistic person to kind of find their niche, and especially if they have like a very um, specific interest, you know, helping them find a way, like, how can I take this interest and turn it into something that I enjoy doing, but maybe I can also get employment from this, or maybe I can sustain myself off of this. Um, so I remember when I first started working with autistic persons, you know, there's this idea of if they have an obsession to take it away from them, 
you know, oh. that's a bad thing. Yeah. That's what um, is taught by, the, by, the, by yeah. theory. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that was like in my early years of, you know, like working with other professionals. It was like, it was thought of as a bad thing. Their restrictive interest is a bad thing and you need to increase their interest. And I think it is good to, you know, show them, uh, you know, to explore the world and to, you know, see different things. But if they have something that they're very passionate about and interested in, um, they excel at their best. And I'll tell you a quick little story. So I had this adult on the spectrum. He was like 40 something years old. Um, and I met him in a bar. And <laughs> he was yeah, he was telling me that his boss has been trying to fire him for like the last 10 years, right? <laughs> trying to fire um, him? Like, yeah, not yeah. much of a so boss. I know. So I was like, oh, okay. Like what happened then? He goes, you know, uh, you know, at first, yeah, he had his social quirks and, you know, he had to learn to sometimes like filter what he said because he can be very direct and that could upset coworkers, you know. Okay. Um, but he was so amazing at what he did that his boss just went above and beyond to make accommodations for him. Like, if you want to work from home, work from home. Mm. If you want to work these hours, you work these hours because he was indispensable, Understood. you know. Be- <laughs> yeah, and I found that so funny because honestly, he reminded me of um, Robin Williams. Like, he was so funny um, when he was telling me this story. But it's like, yeah, you know, he knows his quirks, he owns who he is, and he knows how valuable he is. Because when you put an autistic person in the niche that works for them, they will excel compared to, you know, us sometimes. <laughs> Thrive, yeah. Thrive yeah. in a way. And I mean, if, I feel like sometimes the society. Um, may need to sometimes sacrifice some of like all com- like all neurotypical comforts um, to nurture in a way some of their amazing abilities because um, for instance just thinking back like to you know native tribes and such you know I'm sure there may have been autistic people or people on the spectrum in tribes and I mean there's some some say for like shamanism or, or mysticism um, mm-hmm. and how they're involved and, and maybe those tribes understood a little bit better in a way how to include like in that inclusiveness um, mm-hmm. somehow. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, yeah, the in certain Aboriginal communities, it's really interesting because they sort of see an autistic person as somebody who's you know, kind of gifted and just very sensitive to, you know, energy and um, and whether people believe this or not, because, of course, within the community, everybody has, you know, different beliefs. But right. at the end of the day, their perception of that person is more welcoming and inclusive, as mm-hmm. opposed to the Western perspective, which is, uh, you know, this is something that we need to fix. And this is something that we, we tend to reject the differences as opposed to other cultures sometimes that embrace those differences um and it's funny that you said that because in certain aboriginal tribes it's a sign of respect to like not make eye contact and somebody who is on the spectrum in those communities um you know in the western world we see that as a big thing like oh we need them to increase their eye contact right but if you're from an aboriginal community that's not a behavior that is a big deal, you know. Yeah. So how culture, you know, shapes, autism, yeah, yeah, and shapes those perceptions and perspectives because it's really, um, it's really that that makes up all these preconceived notions that we have. You know, what is normal, and I think it's important right now, especially with um, how things are in the world. Um, everybody's home right now by you know mandatory, where I find a lot of people are questioning those core fundamental beliefs and um systems that we just took for granted before like okay this is normal um and this is normal but you know the new normal is 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 slowly emerging um and not so much by choice but by like um, you know bacteria you know yeah yeah Yeah, no that is so true and i think that's uh the funnest part about the journey through autism is you reach a point where you're forced to question a lot of the things that we called normal and we took for granted as normal, you know? Mm. Um, And that's, I think, the gift of what autism, you know, brings to the community is really forcing and challenging you to 
we know sometimes we're just following things for the sake of following things and we're not really asking why and is this important is this necessary and there's so many things that we do that isolate the autism community and it's not necessary mm-hmm. you know so i mean they were they were going through isolation well before us yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they, you know, they were <laughs> yeah this is like this is normal for them it's like oh, what's what's strange you know yeah, a lot of people are now dealing with this this feeling of isolation, and you know it's a very fresh feeling for them because so much of these social connections and and things we had set up before was just so understood and easily available. Now we have to kind of like structure our days and maybe chat with families on house party or these new apps or whatever. And, and I mean, it's changing how people function. So I feel like yeah. everybody is on the spectrum in a way right now somehow. So I feel like this is why it's so relevant. <laughs> To discuss you know some of your techniques now yeah uh, no it's a uh, it's a good way of thinking of it yeah also one thing i wanted to ask um like i've been having this problem because of political correctness and like you know how how do people in the autistic community want to be spoken about or from your experience how do they feel comfortably being spoken about? do they just want to be included as you say inclusiveness yeah, I think, you know, absolutely inclusiveness. But I think what they want more than anything is to be respected and to be valued. You know, um, what I think is so important about autism awareness is a lot of organizations and nonprofits and professionals are, you know, always at the front of this month, you know. And I think what it does is it sometimes drowns out the voices of there are a lot of autistic advocates out there. There are a lot of um, autistic persons who have views and opinions that um, are not being respected and valued as much as they should, you know. Um, so there's kind of a couple few people in the industry that probably dictate the narrative. I would imagine that's how, yeah, yeah most yeah. most industries, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and you know, it's so crazy to me because I have always, you know, I've had situations where you know a parent comes to me about an issue and i go you know what i'm actually going to reach out to an adult on the spectrum that i know and see what they have to say you know like using them as a consultant you know it's important and um i see so much that their voices just get drowned Mm. and uh, you know their narrative is left out so one of the biggest debates in the autism community is person first language right And if you start looking this up, you will see so many forums of autistic persons saying, I want to be called autistic. I have had teens who they proudly describe themselves as autistic and they don't like that neurotypical people actually come to them and say, oh my gosh, how could you devalue yourself like that? How could you, you're a a person. And it's like, we're all people. But it's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. How you were describing it earlier, like autism, it's not, it's like a lifestyle then. Like if somebody was yeah. to say I'm Christian or I'm Buddhist or whatever, it's like it's a lifestyle. Um, yeah. Maybe not. They're not so much by choice, but it, and they've accepted that as part of themselves. So that's. I mean, it's not something that should be shunned. No, and yeah. I think it, I've always felt very un- when person first language first came out. I was like, this just sounds weird, you know. Mm. Person with autism, you know. Mm-hmm. To, to me, it over highlights a diagnosis as opposed to just saying, "Yeah, I'm autistic." It's I'm like autistic. a feature. An autistic yeah, person, like, right? Cool. I get you. Yeah, you know, and it's just an aspect of yourself, like, and it doesn't mean that that's all you are. You're just describing a a part of yourself that you know is lifelong. You know, so mm-hmm. that's why I personally always say autistic because that's what the community, that's what an autistic person wants. So I choose not to use person first language. Um, so, and and what else? Like going back to somebody like telltale signs, somebody may be autistic. Like, how do I know for myself? Like, if you you said you have like a radar almost right now that's operational. Your, your your brain just knows, you know, because you're so empathetic and sensitive um, and probably spend more time around autistic people, so. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of hard because I think um, for whatever reason, a spark, you know, ignited in me when I started working with autistic persons, you know. So sometimes uh, I could just be in an interaction with somebody and I instantly want to spend more time with that person because I realize they're autistic, you know. Um, mm. So for me, sometimes that's a gauge as to if somebody you know, is autistic. It's if I'm very interested in spending more time with them. Okay. Um, 
But if you yourself are starting to feel, um, you know, am I on the spectrum? I think it is important to note that a lot of people can be spectrum-y. You know, like there are people who can relate to certain traits and attributes of autism, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're autistic. To be autistic, you really do have to struggle with that social challenge, you know, that difficulty with, you know, downloading and interpreting social information and you find it incredibly challenging to develop the relationships that you're looking for. And do um, you feel like like that's changing now with the advent of like, you know, social media and technology and all of that? Do you think that that helps them or if that hinders their community? Um, well, I think technology has been awesome because you're seeing so many um, nonverbal um, artists who can now write books and they communicate their intelligence and they articulate their thoughts. So technology has been absolutely wonderful for the autism community. Um, and they might not necessarily have to go through the t- traditional route of like doing a book launch or like interacting with, you know, so, so it might be, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it, it does help. But I think what it also does is, you know, social media is awesome, but I think sometimes we use it as a platform, but what we lack sometimes is connection. Mm. So I think although, uh, you know, apps and technology is wonderful, I think still a lot of autistic persons, they, they're looking for a connection, you know, and the only way they're going to find that connection is that it can't just be one-sided, them always trying to learn how to accommodate us mm-hmm. socially, you know. Yeah. We have to change the narrative and accommodate them more so that they can connect with us, you know. Yeah, for sure. I I definitely agree with that. I feel like so many different platforms are out right now as well. I mean, just touching on gamers right now, um, do you think there's a link between autism and addiction in some way? Or can Um, be? Well, you know what it is, is that technology is more consistent. And I think that's what an autistic person likes is um, technology is simple for them to understand and us human beings, we are so complex, you know, especially as neurotypicals, you know, we're incredibly complex. We don't really say what we mean and mean what we say. So I completely get why it's overwhelming for them to try to figure out this, you know, social aspect of, you know, being a human. Mm -hmm. But I, I see so much value because there's so many kids I've worked with who are like obsessed with Minecraft. Right. I mean, my, some of my cousins, actually, some of my younger cousins, like, you know, and I, sometimes I don't initially get it, but you know, maybe, There's some... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, but, you know, I actually love um, all this gaming that goes on in the autism community because even sometimes when I'm with a a family and the parent says, you know what, I need to get my kid off the device though. Like, they're they're really interested in in these games and these apps and stuff, but I also want them out in the real world. Hmm. Well, I can learn about their interests and bring that into real life. So the reenactment and theatre stuff comes in, you know? Um, so I can take a kid outdoors and play games with them, but around Minecraft and the things that they're interested in. So ah, okay. I love this interest in technology because you can bring it to life and you can use it as a way um, to teach them things. Like there's actually an autism dad who created an entire platform using Minecraft for autistic persons, you know. So there's a gamification of so many different things. And um, yeah, just it, it helps us unpack those boxes more and look at things from different angles more. I feel like, as you say, you could bring you could bring that whole Minecraft like planting trees or like um, using bricks and these kind of things into reality um, for them, and that could probably yeah. be that's like VR. That's like yeah, it is. <laughs> and honestly, like I I had this um, autistic boy, um, and it's really interesting because I was really scared to do it with him. He was obsessed with Minecraft. And because I've had so many kids who are obsessed with Minecraft, I used to watch Minecraft tutorials for hours, <laughs> drinking wine at night. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, I really wanted him to, you know, do some stuff outdoors with me. And I was so scared that he wouldn't get into the imaginative aspect of it, you know. And at first he was really like, I don't understand what you have planned, you know. Yeah. I don't understand how what he does on the computer could be in real life. And I was amazed at how much he enjoyed much more we were like digging through the ground i planted like diamonds all over the property um i i made all the like figurines from it and we made bow and arrows that we had to shoot all the um creepers and, you, know. you see see because you understand so much of the um 
like the <laughs> the net frame of the video, the, the um the game, you understand so much of the um like little nuances that you could probably relate to him much easier. Yeah. As opposed to somebody who is just like you know fresh. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's the, the tricky part of the job is that I do have to sit down and, like, I have to become obsessed with their obsessions. Uh, that's that's kind of cool. I guess you could, um, and, and interesting to use that word. Right now, somebody in chat is saying they're playing right now. There's a friend of mine from the States, Joanzi, big up Joanzi. He works with ESPN right now. You know, you see me trying my thing with, um, <laughs> with the podcasting. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, what do you think about, like, anxiety and OCD? Because OCD is something that is more... Uh, favored when people say you're OCD that's more like acceptable in a way but I feel like a lot of these different um, as you say spectrum -y things are, are linked and you know how does how does obsession deal with that yeah um, so OCD that you know that is something that you can find with some persons on the spectrum there's a bit of an overlap Right. Um, and a lot of, you know, OCD tendencies, it's, it's kind of like your own way of regulating yourself. If I produce this ritual, um, I feel more comfortable. I feel more safe in the environment. It's uh, and it could be kind of counterproductive. I mean, having an obsession that, you know, just brings you, you know, happiness and helps you socialize and interact. For me, that's a good obsession um, where things can be a bit more challenging is when you have a person who's on the spectrum but also has some obsessive compulsive um, tendencies mm. and they can get very stuck in their rituals and they can become very inflexible mm. um, so you you really have to in those situations develop such a relationship based on trust with that person that they learn to accommodate and become more flexible but then sometimes you do have to accept that they will always maintain a certain rigidity on certain things and find the more flexible tendencies that you can kind of um, get them to adapt more easily. Because it can be very stressful when you need these certain rituals in order to get through your day. Um, I mean, that's kind of like, the, from what you're describing, that sounds like addiction in some way on ship. You know, it could be like people dealing with addiction, very similar um, aspects. Because if you change one aspect of that day, you know, you, you, they might not have a comfortable day. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're kind of two types of, you know, like some kids on the spectrum, they really need that repetitive routine um, because that really uh, decreases their anxiety. And that could be very tricky because when you change a routine or an aspect of the day, they can have these really, um, you know, they can have a tantrum. They can have a, a hard time regulating and adjusting to that shift, you know. Mm. Um, and that unfortunately has a lot to do. It's not something they're doing consciously, which is mm. why we have to be so empathetic. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Um, Back to the empathy. It's, yeah, it's it's just something that in those moments, all you can do sometimes is just help them to manage their distress at struggling to adapt and be flexible, you know. And some of these things resolve themselves over time and as they get older. So you find that these behaviors when they're young and these situations are more intense. Mm. And then as they start to get older, just like with me and you, like we mature as we get older. I um, hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, I, I've met a lot of um, kids who, when they were young, were very restrictive eaters, very picky, very um, inflexible. They had to be home at a certain time. They had to eat at this time. And then now I see them as teenagers and like one of them, you know, uh, called me on WhatsApp and we're talking and he's telling me all these restaurants that I used to love that he suddenly is going to. And I'm oh. like, gosh, when I knew you, you could go to those restaurants. So a new discovery, a new discovery. Yeah, but you know, it just took time, and you know, by the and it's that's why it's so interesting to just watch autism evolve. You know, there with the right support, with the right uh, network, you can really help these challenging behaviors. You know, change and adjust as they get older. You know, and I mean, you you're not you're not changing it to your particular needs, but you're just guiding them and helping them figure it out for themselves sometimes i would imagine you know it's not so much what you want or as a parent what you want mm -hmm. um but more so you know just just assisting them just being that kind of like ropes on the side in a way you know? 
Yeah, because, you know, they they are sometimes frustrated with their inflexibility, you know. They don't enjoy that they can sometimes see something very black and white and they struggle with some gray area, you know. So mm-hmm. that's why the empathy, it just keeps coming back to empathy because in those situations, they are con- frustrated with themselves. themselves. So there's a form of resen- the, like resentment of self now and that's hard. That's even more, you know, tough than another yeah. way. Yeah. And, and you don't want that. You want them to know that, you know, it's okay and you're always there for them. You're always their support. You're always in their corner. And you're not doing it because you want them to be more manageable. You know, you're doing it because you want their lives to unfold with happiness and mm. with, um, you know, their own sense of, you know, dreams being fulfilled. And sometimes you just have to be their support, you know, and let them figure it out and, and trust them too. You know, I don't always like intervene when a kid is having a tantrum like you have to gauge what's my role today in this um because sometimes they learn how to manage their own self you know like they learn how to go and jump on a trampoline because that's what they need right now you know yeah so there's that sense that self-awareness and you know growing through it by themselves that sense of purpose because i mean coming back to the girl who runs the charlie project i feel like she has a deep sense of purpose um and even a lot of, I mean, a lot of millennials right now, myself included, um, I don't even know if I have, I feel that deep sense of purpose right now, hence trying to do this whole <laughs> podcasting, you know what I mean? Because um, you question, you, you, you trust a lot of systems to give you that sense of purpose in a way, like the economy or like, you know, financial freedom. And um, at the core of it, uh, if you don't have that deep sense of purpose within yourself, um then a lot of those things kind of dissipate now. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I mean, I think that's just a, a struggle, you know, for every person, you know, feeling that sense of, you know, purpose, feeling, you know, what is my contribution? Am I appreciated? Am I valued? Um, it's just that for some reason, we make it all the more harder for an autistic person to feel that. Mm. Um, but I think it is, you know, I like to be authentic in my interactions. You know, I don't like to, you know, fake enthusiasm and that sort of thing. I think it helps a person on the spectrum to see you authentically go through emotions. And, okay. um, it, you know, it helps them to feel better about themselves, to understand like, you know, hey, we all struggle through these things. You know, like our parents kind of grew up hiding their stress from us, you know, mm. um, and kind of putting us in that bubble but you know for someone on the spectrum it actually really helps them to you know witness mistakes witness you vulnerability yeah yeah yeah. and uh, you know a lot of professionals working with someone on the the spectrum you're so caught up in your ego of i'm a professional that you know sometimes you do have (laughs) to get down and just be real you know Mm. like be honest be you know vulnerable and authentic because that's how we learn that's how they'll learn the best you know yeah so a lot of neurotypical people may actually be not the cause of the problem but part of the problem um in the sense that they have not fully understood themselves they may be wearing as you know some songs say like a mask or having yeah. this um in a way like a facade to just move through life but at the end of the day it's not helping yourself and it might be helping others as well if you do that too much so yeah i guess i need to be aware of that myself more well yeah i think we all like even i am constantly like trying to aspire to be more self-aware you know but i just think it's so interesting that in the world of autism there's always been this phrase of you know an autistic person they lack empathy but, you know, hmm. if it's anything in my experience is that I have seen more neurotypical persons who lack so much empathy towards understanding their needs. Like and their also, own personal needs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you know, we have a lot of adults and teachers and people who I see a lot of adults and I'm like, wow, that that adult is actually very impulsive, very reactive. Mm. Um, and we don't realize that kids learn these patterns. So, you know, we're always trying to focus on kids, you know, making sure they behave. But as adults, once we become <laughs> adults, we, we don't hold ourselves accountable <laughs> anymore for our behavior. Right, right. Know? Is the police? Is the police? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Everyone's like, 
like, yeah, government, police. It's like, no, how do you hold adults accountable? You know, yeah. jail, you know. And that's like a self, that's a, uh, you, have a, you have to have some for, some of self-regulating system, I would imagine, as every human, you know, um, should. However, some people don't really develop that as much as others, you know, so. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny because when I worked in Quebec for some time, um, and that was really stressful because um, I was learning a new language. Um, I felt like I couldn't express myself in that language. Like I can talk and I can script and say things in French, um, but I couldn't express myself the way I wanted to. So that was really, for me, um, uh, a huge lesson in empathy because I felt what it felt like to not be able to communicate and to always be like, 10 sentences behind and not able to be a part of a conversation mm. and I found that you know the community there in Quebec I love them but you know they're very mm. francophone they they love their French so you know it's, it's a little harsh or it's a little strict in a way okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to say that too much but yeah yeah, you know, I think everybody knows the stereotype. You know, in French, they, they want you to make an effort to speak French, you know. And so I really struggled in the beginning, just really wanting this empathy from people. Like, please understand how difficult it is me, for me learning this language. And the most empathetic people in Quebec were the kids on the spectrum. Wow. There were times that kids were going out of their way and they are autistic to say things in English to me, to speak broken English French. Mm. To, um, they went out of their way to make me feel like I mattered and I wasn't going to be left out. So that was such a lesson in the autistic kids were the ones who had the most empathy towards me when I was really struggling with my language, you know. Understood. And that's kind of same same way, you know, a lot of the way they may feel towards um, neurotypical people in a way. How yeah. How do you think, um, or how do you break down how Asperger's syndrome and autism is linked? Because I think I had a, well, I had a friend, um, or have a friend who was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Um, and I remember when we were young, he would be very good at drawing. Um, you know, he would be fixated on drawing and anime and, um, I mean, his memory functions, I would say, a bit differently from a neurotypical person in the sense that he appreciates and values so much of his childhood. Mm -hmm. It's like deeply rooted. When I say, yeah. you know, sometimes people don't really talk about their childhood moving along in life, but he, he would constantly bring back up childhood memories, deep childhood memories that many of us may have forgotten or just, you know, put in a box somewhere or whatever. Um, how do you how do you think that happens? Why do you think that happens with autistic um, people or, or Asperger's people with Asperger's? Yeah. Um, so just speak. Well, I'll speak about Asperger's just a little bit. Um, so that was a diagnosis that was given. You know, over a certain <laughs> period of time, it was given to explain um, that there are certain people who are on the spectrum who. Um, you're not finding that challenge. They have verbal language, right? And they have, um, you know, intellectual abilities and, and their gifts and whatnot. So um, people would have described them as the more high-functioning artists, right? Um, and I tend to not really uh, use terms like high-functioning. High, because high, high it's like, yeah. Yeah. Structure. Yeah, when you say someone is high-functioning, you ignore their weaknesses, you ignore their challenges. And then if you call somebody low-functioning, you don't set up ambitious challenges for them, you know, mm. but um, so Asperger's was kind of taken out recently, like now in the DSM, it's just autism spectrum disorder. But there are, a lot of, okay. um, there are a lot of people who were diagnosed as Asperger's, that they like that term and they actually identify themselves as ASP. And I love that. So mm. I don't, um, you know, argue or debate that. But what you're saying about all the nostalgia and how they cling to memories mm. is um, an autistic person, they always remember how you make them feel. Uh. And I have had situations where I've worked with an autistic kid, you know, once. And, you know, I just go about my life and my day and I don't think too much of it. And then when the family contacts me and says, oh, you know, he talks about you, he asks, you know, <laughs> mentions you it's like shocking because in our everyday life we just move on day mm. day day 
Um, but for them, they create these fond memories that they really hold on to when you've made them feel good. Mm. And uh, they really cling to the things that make them happy, you know. Um, I feel like they have, they do have, you know, sort of like a visual memory and like uh, energetic memory of how you make them feel, how you interacted with them. And I think sometimes because they're so bombarded with like negative interactions and stress that what they cling to is the positive moments and the people that made them feel good and the memories that they can hold on to that make them happy, you know. I feel like I feel like we need more of that on the neurotypical side because you know it kind of brings to light this whole social media thing, right? I mean, I would have fifteen hundred people, or you know, a page may have twenty thousand people, but the level of interaction and the value we place on those interactions, um, I feel, has been somewhat eroded in a way that it's like it's like so much mass, it's so available and so readily available that we don't appreciate those little interactions so much anymore as when we were like maybe younger and would have like a friend you know you're excited to talk to them or you're excited to go online with them um now with the social media is like okay everything is readily available it's kind of like a like a whole foods place or like a uh, you know like just costco or something you know it's just like with people but with people and i feel like that's dangerous for society it is, you know, because it's still not connection. You can have as many followers as you want and you can have many people like engaging with your profile, but we're still all looking for, you know, meaningful connection, mm-hmm. you know, and something that's emotional, something that really, you know, inspires us deep down, you know, and I think autistic persons have always kind of taught me the value of what you say, you know, like, um, A lot of parents are always like, you know, you have to teach your kids manners, say please, say thank you. Mm. Um, But at this stage, people have just rehearsed manners so much that if somebody says thank you to me, it kind of goes over my head. It's like, yeah, 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 I know, you have to say that, (laughs) Mm. you know. Um, But then I have an autistic person who just suddenly they will just look at you and say thank you. Or they'll look at you and say you're beautiful, you know. Mm. And it's not in the way that like me and you would have meant it, you know, it's. It's so deep and it just reminds me that, wow, that person really meant that thank you. And I felt it, mm, you know, mm. um, and I wish I got more of that in like my interactions with neurotypical persons, you know. Yeah. And I don't I don't want to like other neurotypical people and say, well, we are less than or greater than. But, you know, there are things that we can work on being aware, I would imagine, of mm-hmm. um, some of our flaws and, and um you know, it's just something we, we can be aware of and change, um, whereby somebody with autism might be able to change that hardwired um, brain, you know. Um, I don't know if, do you, do you think neuroplasticity has uh, weight with people with autism? Do you think that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that's why it's really important for um, whether you're a therapist or a teacher or a parent, you know, really making those early experiences and interactions and interventions, um, you know, really focusing on, you know, play and positive experiences because, yeah, you know, the, like I said, some things just change not because of therapy or intervention. You know, they simply mature, you know, their brain, certain areas, they just change and become more flexible. Um, so it's, it's like combining that you know that there's neuroplasticity and you're just thinking, okay, what... How do we... Kid... Yeah, like how do, how do I right now, this kid is four years old, mm. how do I make the best of the fact that there is this plasticity and there is this ability for the brain to change, to rewire itself, to restructure itself, but we only do that from providing these enriching experiences. And unfortunately, sometimes kids on the spectrum are very bombarded with stress and stress does not help with neuroplasticity you know Mm. it actually damages um your brain's ability to you know be able to access certain areas of the brain it really you know so it's so important to think about self-regulation and making sure that you're sensitive to is this kid stressed if this kid is stressed i need to get this kid down to a calmer place Mm -hmm. because then i can't do anything so deep deep breathing you know um equine equine therapy um 
be dealing with animals. All that, these are why all these things help because I would imagine they're stress free environments or like not stress free, but they, they almost create a sense of calm somehow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's so important. That's why, you know, laughter, it's, it's free therapy. <laughs> if you can get someone to laugh, you, don't, you know, uh, right. you don't have to pay for that. It's, it's easy. It's at your disposal. Um, I love working with animals, too. Like, I've worked with rats, frogs, hamsters, <laughs> okay. rabbits, goats, you know, um, whatever. Because all these things, especially animals, they really um, bring out this calm and this curiosity in, in kids and in autistic persons. But again, it could be music, it could be um, dressing up, you know, the theater role play again. Um, just finding what does this person need to do to de-stress, you know, that's really important. Okay, well, I think we're going to try to close up, but, I, you know, in closing, I'm going to ask a couple of few questions just so we could get it, um, you know, in people's head of how, how we can deal with the autistic community, how we can deal with ourselves at this point in time, people at home with their kids, um, teachers in schools, going back out to schools, um, just understanding a bit of that. So just to kind of sum it up, how do you think people with autism function differently and do they function differently? Um, I guess, you know, they obviously function differently if we're, you know, comparing them to what we consider normal, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, they're just managing as best that they can, uh, you know, given the fact that, yeah, their autism affects their everyday, um, their lifestyle. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, they have their value um, in the community. They have a lot to teach us. Um, they have their own skills and talents that we need to help them to discover. Um, and... Yeah, you know, I just think that the, the most important thing is just understanding that we need to be more flexible in our approach, the way that we see things, um, challenging what we see as normal and just being more compassionate, being more empathetic, you know, breaking down all these walls and barriers that separate us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the more that we accommodate for autism in the community is actually the way that we're going to create a better community you know generally just generally yeah in general mm. it's like the upgrade <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's yeah. true it's like we need an update we like, need an update we need a update. yeah <laughs> for real for real <laughs> um, so have you have you met any like super amazingly gifted i'm sure you would have met many gifted people but um if there's any that stand out to you um that you can share a little story about um that would be cool Oh, God, I mean, so many. Well, a couple, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I had a boy that I worked with who, when I tell you, like, he can just download any book that he read, you know. Um, and he was really into space and science. He knows every single, like, the name of every star, every mm. rocket that had ever been launched, every code. Um, it's like yeah. Elon Musk. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, no, like, I highly <laughs> recommend NASA, you need to hire him. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, uh, um, I've met a lot of kids who are autistic, like, um, one, uh, a little boy I worked with, like, he can just go around in the environment, look and touch everything and go home and create an exact drawing, you know, and at this time, he was like four or five years old, what? of what it is he saw throughout the day. Um, I had this other kid who he was really into ice. Mm. And boy, he blew my mind, like the patterns that he could find in ice and in snow. It was incredible. Like he, uh, I thought snow was just basically snow <laughs> when I met him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like a snow, um, a snow specialist. Yeah. And, and then I, I discovered I had a, you know, a hidden talent in memorizing scripts for movies because so many kids on the spectrum, like, wow, they can watch a movie and memorize the entire script you know and i used to have this kid who well not a kid he was a teen but mm. wow i had to learn the whole script for the lion king and madagascar mm. you know and it was so hard for me because he was so 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 quick yeah. you know and i'm i'm with my you know you're now playing the game yeah yeah like wait hold on, yeah, hold I'm, on. Like, yeah, I'm like downloading wait where are we in this script you know mm. <laughs> like 
Um, so yeah, I've, I've met lots of kids who are talented in like visual memory, kids who are talented and they can just, everything that they read, they just process. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I had a, a boy on the spectrum who, if I get, like we gave him a, a cardboard box, we were just, you know, playing and doing different things. And he built a gear system from the pieces within the box. I think I've shared that once on my empath way story, maybe even twice, because it still strikes me that his brain is just wired to engineer things to, wow. to figure out how things can work. You know, like we did a dinosaur activity and we were like, OK, just make a mask. And me and my basic self just <laughs> you know, get a paper, paper plate and paint it. And he built a fully functional dinosaur mask wow, where the wow. jaw moved, you know? And I mean, I'm sure given the right tools and, and um, environment, that, that could be just the most amazing and fulfilling experience for him as well, you know, as just probably his parents, just seeing him thrive in those kind of environments. Yeah. yeah not, not, not exploitively, because I think that could be dangerous as well, but more so like just if they're interested in doing this as well, you know, because I feel like, that's what that's what a lot happens is because we find I mean it's important to highlight these positive attributes of people mm -hmm. who are autistic, but then there's kind of like a disparity now. We there could be a jealousy with other people. You know, they mm -hmm. yeah. You, you know, neurotypical people might look at that person and say, "Oh, they're so yeah. gifted." You know, it's like a cheat code or something. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a it's a balance as well too. So. Yeah, there's a balance, you know, because with those gifts also come some challenges in different areas, you know. So um, we have to appreciate that gifts, but also understand that it also comes at the expense sometimes of, you know, having that social hardware, you know, and, and other things. Mm. Um, but I think what I learned through all those experiences, especially with working with teachers, I would say this is important. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's actually somebody in chat right now, sorry to interrupt, but... Um, somebody who's a teacher but also a photographer they say um, at work they've interacted with some students that they've suspected are autistic um, of course it's their unprofessional suspicion but what could you how could you say well you know what you were going to say how to help teachers maybe identify and nurture yeah um, you know it's kind of like, you know, how important a, a diagnosis is, you know, like you'll see certain behaviors in kids in a classroom. And sometimes it is actually really hard to identify is the root of this behavior autism or is the root of it, you know, ADHD or something else, you know. Um, so I think the most important thing to tell a teacher is just taking a lot of information, always asking the question, why is this kid possibly reacting this way and why is it happening now what context does it happen in a lot of the time and try to create a sort of a diary and a journal of you know how the kid is responding and taking in information you know um, if you suspect it's autism you may notice that they're very sensitive to lighting very sensitive to sound smell um, certain textures um, they may have a lot of you know difficulty with the number of kids in the classroom and managing certain situations and you know the most important thing is to you know you can talk to the parents as well and find out you know what their view of the kid is at home and start to guide that parent towards okay you know maybe you can get this kid assessed mm -hmm. um, you could bring somebody into the school as well to do a bit of an assessment um, it's really hard to diagnose a person on the spectrum it's a long process it's teachers have to make reports parents have to do an interview then you have to go to a professional to, um, you know, really discover is the underlying nature autism. But in a classroom, what you want to think about with a kid is, is this kid stressed? What mm. can I do to manage this kid's stress? Um, what does this kid need right now? Maybe this kid does not need to sit at this desk right now. Maybe they need to run around for a few laps. Okay. Um, maybe this kid needs to, technology. You know, actually, that's the most common thing. You find kids on the spectrum, they struggle with handwriting. Mm -hmm. And that is such an intense battle with sometimes an autistic person that giving them an app, giving them a device where they can still show that they're intelligent um, and not in the way of a standardized test and not in the way of handwriting um, is really important, you know. Well, somebody, somebody in chat is the same person, um, Phil, but um, 
Island Vision, he is saying that maybe you can perhaps start some form of like workshop um, that could aid schools to, to bring them to that level to understand, you know, um, yeah. and make it more of a comfortable environment because I would imagine um, from the time somebody is labeled or assessed, there could be some form of bullying as well. So, I mean, it's, it's not only raising the awareness of the teachers, but also the students um, around them because bullying is a whole other aspect that comes into it and that, you know, is dealing with trauma, you know, and that's, yeah. I feel like, how do you, how do you deal with that um, trauma? Yeah, um, well, just going a little bit back to, you know, the teacher's comments. So I do do workshops and I have designed um, my own workshops for, for teachers. Uh, of course, my M pathway, it only started when I left my job in Quebec um, end of last year, you know, so okay. it's very new, but it is a service that I do offer. I can come in, I can do Zoom conferences. I have presentations on how to change the climate of the classroom to accommodate certain needs. Um, but kind of going back to what you're talking about, trauma and bullying. Yeah, that's why it's so important that we empathy is a seed that needs to be planted in kids from a very young age because it will decrease bullying you know um and there is this program um, i think it's called seeds of empathy where they actually have babies come into a classroom and and i would actually like to do it with animals as well coming into classrooms for kids at a really young age to start teaching them empathy teaching them perspective taking and I personally find with kids that when they start to do these behaviors towards, you know, animals and vulnerable beings like a baby, they then start to practice that more and more with, you know, other humans and their peers, you know. Um, so if somebody wanted to get in touch with you um, about starting a program or, or um, you know, getting involved, how would they do? Do they just go on your empathway? Um, dot ESD on Instagram can you leave a number or yeah so well I usually don't get leave my number yeah right yeah <laughs> no problem privacy yeah I'm always busy at work but usually what I would do is if you direct message me through my Instagram account I usually then directly send my email address and I try to get a sense of what information you want if you're a nonprofit if you're a teacher I have different intake forms that I would send they are very much forms that you have to be very detailed in because <clears throat> my whole philosophy is, you know, um, I'm tailoring my advice to you, you know. So the more information I get, the better it is. And then when I've kind of established that, you know, email relationship, I do give my number at that point and I do try to set up, you know, a Zoom, a conversation. Um, you can also check me out through my Facebook. But right now I've really been doing a lot better with, people messaging me directly into on my Instagram. Pathway. Awesome. Yeah, on so Instagram. yeah, so everybody just check out her page. We'll have it at the end of this video um, who's interested. Um, but one of the last things I want to kind of touch on is trauma and coping mechanisms for everybody who's at home right now. Um, they may be dealing with some sense of trauma. It might be instantly identifiable. But how how could you advise dealing with that um, from your perspective? Um, yeah, I, well, especially now with everything and going through COVID, I think um, I think one thing that it's important to do is to unplug a little bit from time to time. Um, so kind of step away sometimes from a lot of the information, the social media, um, you know, give yourself breaks throughout the day where you're not bombarding yourself with information that makes you anxious or fearful, um, you know, Finding ways to regulate yourself is the most important thing, you know, and finding ways to decrease your stress and your anxiety, you know. So if you need to get up an hour earlier before your kids and do a little exercise in a way that you enjoy or do, you know, some movement or listen to music, clean or do something that, you know, could really ground you and bring you down into a good space, then you, you've set yourself up to have a better day, you know, because with trauma, you're really trying to decrease your own anxiety and try to get stress your levels. Space. Yeah, in managing your own stress levels. So I personally advocate for, you know, I sometimes have busy days and I will do an exercise in my shower or 
you know, sometimes, you know what, you're sitting on the toilet, you know, <laughs> listen to music, read, do something for yourself, because sometimes the moments that you have to yourself are the not... The little like ones, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but whatever moment you do have, do something for yourself, and Mentally I think we all, yeah, can benefit from having a sense of purpose. So, you know, during this time, if you have a skill or you have a talent, you know, try to use this time to connect with that, whether it's through art, whether it is through having a vlog or, you know, so if you are going podcast. to use social media, yeah, <laughs> podcast, you know, <laughs> you know, try to create this sense of not isolation, you know, that we all have a role to play and let's use social media in a way to, you know, inspire support and inspire um, our community. And it's, it's little acts of self-love, you know, not being hard on yourself. Like I tell parents all the time, they are judging themselves so much right now. Like I'm a bad parent. I can't get my kids engaged, you know, and, and that negative self-talk is damaging, you mm. know? So you have to rewrite your script. I'm doing my best. I'm doing what I can. And I'm seeking out resources that are going to be more helpful. You so know? positive affirmations, um, being aware of your, your thoughts and what affects um, some of your thinking. Because I know yeah. a lot of the media, right? Just go ahead. Yeah, you know, what you eat as well too, you know. Like being indoors right now, it's not the time to really have too many sugary snacks. Because, mm. you know, these things really do affect our mood, you know. And I see it a lot with autistic kids, how what they eat can really impact their moods. Um, so for your kids and for yourself, you know, you do want to make sure during this time that you are moving your body, that you find some way to get some form of movement or exercise. So even if that is blasting music, I've done this before, and just <laughs> dancing with kids. Yeah, it's, it's the best therapy. You laugh, you dance, you move your body. Kids get out explosive energy. Um, yeah, you just have to find really creative ways to... Um, it's mind, body, and mind, you know, it's sometimes you have to use your body to control your mind with, like, exercise, and other times you have to use your mind, like, with affirmations or breathing uh, true. to then control your body. So it's top down and bottom it's up sometimes. Back and forth between those, those two. Don't, don't sit on a podcast for um, an hour and a half <laughs> <laughs> or on the computer for two hours just scrolling, you know what I mean? That's not good. But yeah, after this, I'm definitely going to get some outdoor time. I'm going to get some sc screen break time. Um, yes. <laughs> because the technology can just be overwhelming at times. So, uh, it can. You know, don't stay on Netflix too much. <laughs> out in the garden, you know? Yeah. Um, anything you want to leave people with um, in terms of how they could get in touch with you? Um, you know, any last bit of advice generally? You know, I'm just a really friendly person and I really want that my Instagram is, you know, I've never, even though I am a consultant, I've never been like, oh, I'm not going to respond to you because I'm going to charge you. You know, I've <laughs> never been like that. So I really want people like, don't feel afraid to reach out to me. Please understand that there's no like one size fits all. Um, I'm always here to offer support and to lend advice, but it's like an ongoing process, you know. Mm. I can't solve someone's problems in an hour phone call, you know. It's a, it's a process. There's no easy fix, long... no quick fix. Yeah. yeah, yeah. there's no copy and paste. I send you these top 10 tips and your life is changed. <laughs> right. it's, it's a relationship. It's a process. So, you know, be patient with that process as well. And I really want, you know, people to kind of interact and engage. And I want to share more. Like, if you reach out to me on my Instagram, I really want to share more about other people. Like, it's not just about me. I want to create a platform where a lot of voices are being heard, a lot of concerns are being um, highlighted. So I really am just looking for, like, an engaging but connective relationship. You know, I'm not interested in followers, but I am interested in, you know, connecting. Strengthening and that community. And, I mean, that, that segues, like, perfectly... Uh, for me as well because that's I mean that's this whole what this whole thing is about I'm hoping that you can probably start your own podcast series or maybe even just calling people and having them you know on on Instagram live that would be great um, just to kind of share their perspective as well parents um, people with autism or autistic people and change my narrative yeah. autistic yeah. people yeah. yeah having them on your go ahead 
I'm still learning technology. Like I wish I had your skill set because I, I, you know, I'd love to do those things. But I am a bit. I, I'm a gardener. I work with animals and yeah. kids. You know? Careful what you wish for. Like. It's just like, <laughs> hey, I'm a gardener too. I have my little god. Yeah, this thing is. This thing could get very, um, very intense. But um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it was really, it was really good talking with you. I hope we could have a follow up conversation on some more topics in the future. Um, yeah. Please go check out her page. Uh, let me pull it up here. See if I could do some live editing. <laughs> this is um, Wanda's page. Empathway dot asd on Instagram. And let me just make that full screen so you guys could see. Um, go check out and. You know, if you need to get in touch with her about any of any of your concerns, what you might be dealing with personally, um, feel free to message her. Um, on another note, I do have a challenge right now I'm trying to do for this little small community that's emerging from this podcast. And it's trying to get people to share their stories of how they're dealing with COVID-19 at home. Um, or at work, you know, people are some people are essential right now. So, um, if you could just send a short video, maybe like 30 seconds to a minute, just saying, well, how you and your family might be coping or dealing with the situation of COVID 19 and being isolated. Because one of the ways I would have dealt with it is by doing this whole podcast. So, that's my 30 second or like hour and a half long explanation. <laughs> Of how COVID is affecting me. I've started a podcast. <laughs> we'll see where things go. Um, really appreciate Wanda being, Wanda being on. And yeah, a big up to Healing with Horses. That's where we met. Another really yeah. amazing community. Big up Veronica. <laughs> and the, yeah, Buk and the Veronica. Buku folks. Um, Lennon. Lennon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you if you guys want to be featured in any of our upcoming episodes, feel free to message me or call me on any of my social media platforms. Um, this is not a charge service. It is free. Conversation is free. Community is free. I think it's one of the most valuable things that we have on the face of this earth. And I would like to nurture that with you guys. Hopefully you would talk to me a bit. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in closing, I just want to stress a little bit. I'm, I'm reading off a script right now. I don't do very well with script stuff, scripted stuff. So um, in closing, I just want to stress again how much I appreciate you guys who tuned in um, for however long you did. Please like and share this when, it, um, when it's finished um, so others, pe other people could experience this podcast series. Um, I hope you could join the community as well on Facebook. If you search Equilibrium Podcast, you should find the group and... Uh, basically, people will approve your um, your request. Uh, yeah, look forward to chatting with everybody else online right now. Um, everybody at home, teachers, students, parents, um, creatives, engineers, whoever, whoever. You know, my friend list is very huge, but um, I we don't chat as much as we should. So definitely reach out, and you could be featured on equilibrium podcast so yep thanks Wanda and we'll catch up yeah thank you for having me it was awesome <laughs> all right cool peace everybody bye bye <laughs>